But I was asked to speak just a little bit this morning, and it sounds like God's been working in a way that a lot of the discussions today are along the same lines of what was put on my heart to, to bring today. Uh, when I was originally asked to speak, I uh, talked to Leland about what the the theme for the morning was going to be, and, and he said, well, Thanksgiving. Well, that seems appropriate, I guess. Uh, so how am I going to speak about being thankful? It seems kind of obvious, right? Uh, in fact, I'm going to ask you right now. When should we be thankful? Always. For what should we be thankful? All things. Everything. See? I knew you guys had it mastered. So, what am I going to talk about? Uh, but, if I'm being honest with myself, maybe I'm not thankful all the time. Uh, I mean, I intend to be, but something seems to get in the way, something that affects my attitude and, and kind of steals my joy. So a couple of things were put on my heart, and uh, the first one is this uh, passage from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. I'm going to read that from the NIV to start. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray as we get started. Father, we're so grateful for all the requests that were shared today, the way that you're working within the body of Christ here in this church and throughout the world. We pray that as we look ahead to this week that we'll continue to focus on how we can bring our offerings of thanksgiving to you and to remain focused on what the mission that you have for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. The other thing that was put on my mind was a, a book that I'd recently read, and a lot of it really struck a chord with me. And so I thought as I was looking at this scripture, some of the passages from that book kind of tied in with that. So I'm not going to make this a book report, but I want to share a, a few little passages from that book. The book's called Undistracted. Uh, it's written by a guy named Bob Goff. Maybe some of you have read some of his stuff before. I don't know. Uh, I'm not up here to make claims about his theology, but like I said, a lot of his words really resonated with me as I, as I read them. Uh, I'm going to start with an excerpt from the book that kind of sets the stage for what gets in the way of our gratitude thankfulness and joy. He writes, sometimes we are so busy looking up and looking forward, trying to figure out the next moves in our lives, or looking backward at all the places we have been, that we don't look down and figure out where we actually are. We live much of our lives struggling for focus, unsure of how to interact with family or friends. We fret about our popularity and our faith. We question our choices. No wonder we are confused. We arrive as babies, placed in the arms of parents who are complete amateurs with no owner's manual and usually no clue how to raise us. Most of us start out broke or broken, and some of us stay that way. Some strike it rich, but then accumulate a distorted view of their wealth. Still others never find healing in their search for wholeness. Add to this, we're following a God we can't see for a lifetime we can't measure to a heaven we can't comprehend because of grace we didn't earn. Again, is it any wonder we're all a little muddled? In truth, we are trying to build the airplane while flying it, figuring it out as we go. This means more off-ramps than on-ramps, more chances for confusion than certainty, and more ambiguity than clarity. In a word, much of life can leave us feeling completely, inextricably, absolutely, and totally distracted. When this happens, one of the first casualties is our joy. I just think he paints a really interesting picture of what life is for most of us. And this is not a new problem. Paul was writing this letter to the church in Philippians. 
uh, from prison in Rome, and yet the theme of the letter is all about joy. In fact, the book of Philippians is often organized into four parts. Joy in suffering, joy in serving, joy in believing, and joy in giving. Paul's wanting to communicate to them how to be joyful in everything. His joy comes from his knowledge of and relationship with Jesus, and he wants the Philippians to be joyful in every circumstance, even when things are going badly. We're only looking at a few verses, but I wanted us to understand the overall theme of the book. Our passage starts out in verse 4 with, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say again, rejoice. When I hear the word rejoice, I think to take joy, to find joy, to be grateful, to be thankful, to celebrate even. And I totally understand rejoicing in the arrival of a new baby or the first leaves of spring or even just a great day with family. Those are easy things to rejoice about. But these are not emotions that I associate with uh, a great deal of everyday events. In fact, there's usually about a million things every day that bring the opposite of rejoicing. I rarely rejoice in running late or find joy in stuck being stuck in traffic or celebrate filling the gas tank or find gratitude in bad weather. Like the book says, I get so busy looking forward and backward that I struggle to focus on who is in control, why I'm here, and I become distracted by 100 details that don't matter. Modern day life is really filled to bursting with distractions that take away our focus and our joy. We're constantly being bombarded with the message that I'm not rich enough, strong enough, thin enough, young enough, tall enough, famous enough, whatever it is. I don't have the biggest house or the newest truck or the coolest phone. If I just had some of these things, then maybe I'd be happy. And it's not always the negative things either. There are a lot of distractions that seem important, even noble and beneficial. But are they helping us fulfill our ultimate goal as followers of Christ? Here's another passage from the book that hit me with a, a, a number of arrows as I read it. He says, most people hope they'll find happiness at home but the hard truth is they aren't around long enough to experience what's already waiting for them there. Simple and complicated distractions take us away from the people we love. When this occurs, the result is both subtle and toxic. We start to settle for proximity rather than presence with each other. You will know this is happening if you only listen for the highlights in your loved one's conversations without taking note of the emotions and body language that are present in the room. These distractions are masked in familiar disguises like career, appointments, and promotions. They invade our homes and come dressed as extracurricular activities, sports, and electronic screens. They can look like business calls, and video games, Zoom conferences, television shows, committees, and meetings, and sometimes even churches. Wow, I thought most of those were good things, right? I thought that was all supposed to be Good things to be involved in. Um, anyone else feeling overwhelmed by activities that all seem like good things to be involved in? Just me? Okay. And yet we wonder why our relationships and our ministries suffer. We're so busy with so many things that we can't do any of them well. And this leads us to be stressed out, anxious, and often angry. We take it out on strangers and acquaintances, coworkers, even family. Let's go back to Philippians 4. Verse 5, let your gentleness, or in some translations, reasonableness, be evident to all the Lord is at hand. If we would just start by being considerate of each other, believer and non-believer alike, showing grace to those around us, that act alone is going to immediately set us apart from most people. Verse 6 takes it a little bit farther. It says, do not be anxious in anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When we find our, ourselves anxious, stressed out, angry, we need to bring our concerns to God in prayer. If we want to worry less, let's pray more. Let's let him carry that burden instead of putting it on ourselves. He promises that when we do, verse 7, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'd say finding the peace of God would be a good way to recover our joy. And having our hearts and minds guarded is going to keep out those pesky distractions. Verse 8 even gives us the roadmap to get away from those joy-stealing distractions. It says, Finally, brothers, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's what we put into our minds that's going to ultimately come out in our thoughts and actions. I experience this every day when I read through the news headlines. Uh, ever since I started my current career, I always felt like it was a good idea to stay current with what's going on in the world. Uh, just having a broad knowledge of current events, you know, I interact with dozens of people a day, and it just gives me more ways to connect. Uh, but when I start reading through headlines that are all about murder and fraud and wars and child abuse, I can feel my joy drain away. I start to feel anxious and I start to worry. And if I stop there, that's what's going to come out in my interactions. I'm going to be negative about the world. I'm going to be complaining. I'm going to be bitter about how messed up the world is. But this is where I need to stop and pray and look at things that are pure and lovely and admirable. If I bring my focus back to the mission of reaching people with the good news instead of dwelling on the bad news that's in our broken world. Verse 9 is where the rubber really meets the road. Paul says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. It's easy to read the Bible, listen to a message, even debate uh, the meaning of a scripture. But if that's all we do, we're really missing the most important step. We're not living it. As followers of Christ, we're to model Christ to others. This is an area that many self-professing Christians around the world are deficient in. If we rely on our knowledge of God as a substitute for our relationship with him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. If the world is full of anxious, angry, distracted, and unhappy people, we should be something new and different. Of course, that's much easier said than done. Here's another paragraph from the book that I think sums it up well. He writes, We can all be new creations if we want to be. The cold hard truth is, most people don't. We settle for the safe and distracted life we know rather than the one God has promised is available to us. Sure, we can agree that Jesus wants us to be new creations, but if we keep doing what we've always done, we've got to admit there's nothing new about it. A total reset isn't easy, and it involves risk. Maybe an enormous tragedy or loss causes us to reset. Or reset might result from simply making time to clear our minds in the morning. Find a new rhythm for your heart. Here is my simple suggestion. Decide in advance that you will do whatever it takes to get your heart right, and then do it even if it will kill all previous versions of you. Obviously, it's never easy to change. Uh, but as the saying goes, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Sometimes it does take a big event, like a heart attack or a personal tragedy, to provoke us into a different direction. But maybe, like he says in that last, little, that last paragraph, we just need to make a decision. So as we gather with our friends and loved ones this week and we think about what we're thankful for, let's consider how we can change our personal attitude and get our heart right. Let's rejoice in everything. Let's be gentle to those around us. Let's worry less and pray more. Let's focus on things that are good and pure and righteous. We can replace the bad news with good. We can evaluate the activities that keep us busy. And most importantly, we can decide to block out the distraction and live our life as a new creation in Christ. Let's pray again. Father, we just ask that you would create a clean heart in all of us, that you would change our attitudes, that you would help us to see the distractions that are getting in the way of living out the mission that you've given us. Help us to evaluate the activities that affect us, that keep us distracted and keep us away from that path. Lord, we look forward to good times with family this week. We pray that those will be just blessed times of reconnecting, 
celebrating and rejoicing. And yet, even if there are hard things, we hope that we will be able to rejoice as well, that we know that you're in control and that you are have a plan for all of our, our life. Lord, we think of the Tillotson family and with Renee especially and just the, the loss that they've had this week. We just pray that the services today and tomorrow will be a time of just encouragement and that you will work in that family to show them that you still care. We pray now that as we go from the service, that you'll give us the time to ponder the things we've thought about today. And that we'll look to ways to not only put it in our heads, but to instill it in our hearts. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.